You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and today I welcome Di Manuel. Di is a lifestyle mentor, fitness coach, motivational speaker, professional blogger, competitive athlete, and all-around life enhancer. After personally battling obesity as a teenager, he became committed to engaging as many people as possible in living healthier, more active lives. He believes that lifelong happiness and well-being must be built on a rock-solid foundation of health and that a sustainable, healthy lifestyle is possible for everyone. Di, welcome to the show. Thank you, Heather. Pleasure to be here. I'm so stoked to have this conversation with you today. I'm excited about today's topic as well, but before we hop into that, why don't you spend just a few minutes introducing yourself to the audience? All right. Well, first challenge of the day, right? Samai's 46 years in a couple minutes. So <laughs> as you may have picked up there, I'm 46 years young and I, I grew up in Canada. I still live in Canada, but I've traveled the world with my family over the last number of years. And and man, what a great education you get yeah, through that experience. And uh, it, it's definitely shifted things for me. So, you, you know, I, I didn't come from healthy living. Uh, I was morbidly obese as a teenager. Uh, and that came through some trauma, some personal trauma that that happened just with my, my parents and myself and my family dynamics. But I learned very early on that I could console myself by manipulating certain chemicals in my body. And I did that through food, not not necessarily healthy stuff. It wasn't like I was saying, more salad, please, right? And, uh, and then on top of that, uh, video games and, and movies. So I was getting those little dopamine hits, those little satisfying moments of distracting myself from the life that I was not happy in and uh, made some shifts when I got to 15 years old, which really after 20 months of just being consistent, dedicating myself to to really trying to be my healthiest self, everything changed. And it really set me on a trajectory where I knew that I wanted to work in the health industry in some capacity. And I wasn't sure what it was going to look like initially, um, but over time, a number of years working as a trainer and as a coach and performance coach in various disciplines, uh, I stumbled upon equipment sales and uh, I got into equipment sales, uh, selling fitness equipment and very quickly excelled at that. And I also realized it was the first time I was getting paid for performance, not just an hourly wage. And I was like, you mean the more people I help get healthy, the more money you'll pay me? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, sign me up, you know? And uh, and it really just uh, expanded into a 17-year career where I was a co-founder of a company that we scaled to eight figures a year, loved every moment of it. But I'll tell you, I struggled a lot. Uh, and, and some of that was from personal choices because, you know, I went from video games and movie watching and, and food and started to get healthier, but I was still looking to distract myself from some unresolved issues from when I was younger. And I discovered alcohol. So that's a whole nother story there. I won't get into it all right now, but uh, it's been 15 years since I had a drink now. So I can celebrate that. And also during that time of scaling a company, I, I met my beautiful wife. I've been dating her happily for the last 23 years. And we have two beautiful daughters that are 18 and 20. Uh, my youngest just graduated high school, is off to university in September. So I'm on the verge of becoming an empty nester, which is intimidating in its own right, because I don't know what that life's going to look like right now. So, um, And now I just really help people with change, help them navigate change in a more positive mindset. And really adopt change as as something that they can be proactive and a champion around rather than always feeling like we're a victim of it. And so that's that's really me, you know, three and a half minutes of uh, the last 46 years. And uh, I skipped over a lot of stuff, but it's all good. I figure it'll come out of the wash. Yes. And for the stuff that doesn't, we'll be sure to have links to the YouTubes and the notes below. But I love that you say that you're dating your wife and congratulations on being an empty nester. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Heather. <laughs> I might be messaging you for some tips. <laughs> That's great. But I love this idea of helping people navigate change. And before we started recording, you threw out this phrase that really resonated with me and I know will resonate with my audience. And that is struggle with the juggle. Because my audience, maybe they were in a pattern of doing life. They had their family, their kids, their partner, their job, 
They were keeping up their house. They had their hobbies, their fitness routines. And then they decide to go into a doctoral program. Mm. And now if the juggle wasn't already kind of stressful before, it certainly is now. And you know what? I don't think anyone's immune to that. <laughs> it's, it, there, there's always something, right? And, and you know what? I think it's a part about being a human and having this, this human experience. It, you know, there's that, that desire, as, as Maslow always alluded to, and this is the hierarchy of needs, right? Was this idea of the self-actualized self and wanting to be our best versions, right? And even when you look at some other uh, uh, thought leaders, you know, talking about the hero's journey as an example, right? It's, it's like choosing the path that allows us to experience the most amount of joy, happiness, and fulfillment in life. And all of that sounds awesome. And I'm like, great. Is there a button I can push to get that? <laughs> you know? right. and, and all of a sudden you realize it's like, whoa, there's a lot of these waves that keep coming at me that are preventing me from getting up on the surface, you know, so I can ride it, you know, I just keep getting pummeled. And I think a lot of us deal with that. There's a movie in 1982 that came out called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Harrison Ford. Great movie. Okay. First five minutes of the movie, there's Harrison Ford running through this cave system and they trigger this booby trap. And there's this massive boulder that's like 10 times his size coming barreling down behind him as he's trying to run and escape this. I feel that that scene is a perfect metaphor for how all of us deal with change. <laughs> okay changes the boulder and it's coming at us sometimes we feel like it's out of our choice out of our power out of our control and you know the thing is is sometimes learning how to to, to just accept the change is coming is the first step to saying okay it's coming what's going to be my role in this part of change you know and so i invite people you know so as much as you're struggling with the juggle it's like well what balls are you actually having up in the air and they are the balls that you care about, you know <laughs> and and, and and so those are some of the questions that I love to pose to people. And uh, but yeah, struggle with the juggle, man. That's a tough one, isn't it? This idea of accepting that change is coming may sound so simple and so common sense, but I can't tell you how many doctoral students I've worked with that thought they could just continue how life was and add another ball that they were juggling. Right. Well, mm -hmm. now I'm just going to add graduate school. And I just want to say time out. Well, then what ball are you letting go or <laughs> how fast, you know, what pace do you want to be juggling? Because you can't do it all. I, okay, here's my personal philosophy. You can't do yeah. it all, do it all well and enjoy life. Correct. I, I would think that that's the very true statement, at least based on my own experience, you know, and, uh, I can relate to what it's like to carry a lot of balls in the air. And, and what's even worse is it, you know, we have this certain expectation ourselves. I know everyone to some level deals with this. And, and I can only imagine those that are now pursuing that doctoral uh, degree and designation, you know, the amount of schooling and effort and work and dedication and commitment. And I'll go as far as to say sacrifices that are made to pursue that endeavor is, is remarkable. But at the same time, it, it's like I see with a lot of high performing individuals, the personal health side of things. It goes on the back burner, right? And, it, and, and it's almost like we, we, we treat ourselves like a martyr, right? And, and it's like, it's okay. I'll sacrifice my health in pursuit of this. And when I get to that designated goal, then I'll try to reclaim my health. And, but you don't realize there's more balls that are waiting for you once you graduate, right? And then I think, right. I think you know, it's very well, Heather. And, and so it's like, if we don't start to manage how we commit our use of time and energy and resources, and reallocate a, just even a little bit of that every day to ourselves and our, our, our self-care yeah. and our personal health and well-being and really developing that resiliency, that foundation of resiliency, it's just going to be a cycle that repeats itself. It really will. It's just in different forms, but it's the same cycle. And many of the guests I've had on talk about this idea of self-care, which is one of my mm -hmm. favorite topics. And I think it's so for anyone in a human body, right? I say, if you're in a human body, you need to care about this. But especially if you're in a stressful doctoral program, you can't think clearly. You can't make good decisions. You can't write well. You can't articulate what you need to articulate to your committee in the way that it needs to be heard if you're super stressed out and not taking care of yourself. And that includes pushing it off like you're saying, and now you've got a chronic health problem, or now you're sick, 
or now you're under the weather and you're trying to do all these things. How do you convince people that self-care is worth taking a look at and investing in? Well, I've always believed that health was important, you know, especially when I made that big shift as a teenager, going from like BMI well in the 40s to trying to reclaim my health, to, to really, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are like, what was the initial motivation? I was like, well, I don't want a girlfriend, you know, and the underlying uh, theme there was I actually just wanted somebody to want, you know, I wanted to feel a value. Uh, and, and so I've seen that repeat itself in different ways throughout my life, right? We're, we're seeking that attention, that affirmation, that confirmation. And, and that was definitely me. You, you know, if you think about the five love languages, you know, words of affirmation have, have always been my primary. And, and so as such, you know, getting into these situations where, you know, a lot of responsibilities are not only thrust upon us, but we're also like, Hey, give me more. I can do this. You know, look at me, you know, da, da, da. and that's <laughs> the bridge where we realize we might be taking on more than we can handle, you know? And I, I definitely have lived in that space very, very much so. And for, for literally like a decade, you know, when I was scaling my, my original company. And so for me, I got to a place where I was so overwhelmed. I just overwhelmed. Like you, I knew something had to give, but you're constantly like, as you said, with the balls, it's like, oh, I dropped one. Okay. I'll pick it up. Okay. Get going again, you know? And, oh, I dropped it. Okay. Don't worry. I got it back up again, you know? And, and it was this constant cycle of feeling like I actually, I kept making mistakes. I kept failing. I kept tripping. And as someone that, that holds themselves to a very high standard, like I'm sure your audience does as well, it, it's, that hurts. It hurts to, to, to acknowledge, to, to actually say to not only yourself, but maybe to acknowledge to others. It's like, you know what? I'm having a hard time handling all this. I'm feeling a bit stressed out right now. You know, I'll go as far as to say, if I keep going down this path, I might experience some burden. And that's what happened to me, you know, because I didn't know how to ask for help. And I was too proud to ask for help because I, I didn't want to. I thought it would show me being weak. You know, here I am, the co-founder of this big company that's scaling. I got all these people that that I'm responsible for. And I'm like, well, I can't tell them that I'm struggling. What's that going to say about our company? How will that reflect on us? You know, and, and so there was all these little stories or narratives I would make up in my own head to justify me not doing anything to change the situation I was finding myself being compounded in over time. And eventually, it got to a place where I couldn't ignore it or push it off any longer. I, I literally crashed and I was, I was hospitalized for a week. And, you know, the doctors at that point were just like, it's burnout. It's exhaustion. It, it's just like, not only are you dehydrated, you're, you're malnourished, you're under recovered, you know, you're, you're a stress case, right? You know, and also at that time I was masking a lot of things and a lot of the overwhelm just by drinking, you know, I'd have my couple of drinks or a bottle of chip at night and, and wake up the next morning, do it again, thinking that it's all good. I just had a nice mental reset last night, you know, not really taking into account the effects of the alcohol long-term, but also on my mental health. Well, I got into the hospital, made some changes, saw a natural path, you know, I saw uh, another medical doctor, a functional medicine practitioner, made some changes, started to feel a bit better. But soon enough, I didn't really change a lot of the habits. I got myself back to a place where I felt, oh, okay, I feel good. Oh, you know, I can probably handle more. Yes, I'll take that on. Hey, do you want to do that? Yes, I'll take that. You know, I'd I had yesitis, right? Just saying yes to every opportunity yep. that came my way, right? And sure enough, I crashed again. But this time, I wasn't bouncing back. In fact, my immune system was crashing to the point that they had to put me in an isolation ward where they, most patients that are dealing with various forms of cancer, full on, like it looked like they had the whole hazmat suits on. Even when my wife came to visit me, she had to garb totally up and mask because I had no neutrophils. My body had just... Like, None. And they figure this is a chronic condition I've probably had all my life, but I've masked it with my health and my, some of my lifestyle choices until I couldn't any longer. And I was hospitalized for almost two weeks, three bone marrow biopsies over the next few months to get to the place where they diagnosed me with autoimmune neutropenia. And all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, okay, I'm, gonna, I, I'm now one of those many people out there that have some sort of an autoimmune condition. And I'm like, what do I do now? Because it completely shifted who I believed I was and who I believed I was becoming, you know, because all of a sudden it's like, well, I can't outwork this condition. Right. In fact, I have to actually take a step back. I might have to look at shifting how I'm living my life and how I'm showing up and what I'm doing 
And so there was this whole paradigm shift I had to go through, and it was scary as all heck, okay? Uh, full disclosure, it was not an easy process, but it was a worthwhile process. Um, but I had to also learn how to ask for help to get vulnerable and recognize that vulnerability isn't a weakness. It's not a male thing. It's not a woman thing. It's a human quality that we all have. You know, we're, we're emotional human beings. We're not human beings being emotional. And, and there's a reason for that. It's just how we're wired. And, and so I had to get to that place. And once I did, everything changed very quickly, very quickly and all for the better, you know, and I've had to make a commitment not to go back to that, which is hard because it's hardwired to me. Okay. For sure. Uh, for sure. It's, like, hey, it's, a, daily struggle, right? oh, it's a daily oh struggle, right? It's a daily struggle. Is it ever? But, with yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I mean, have, have you had a similar experience, Heather? Yeah, you said so many yeah. things I'd love to unpack. Yeah. The first is, yes, I did yeah. have a similar experience, as did many of my guests who come <laughs> on and promote learning how to, you know, whatever, however you want to say this, balance life better, um, prioritize self-care, invest in your own health and well-being so that you can serve others. Most of them crashed and burned, if not once, multiple times. And listeners, we're here to save you from having to have that crash. <laughs> um, you know, and then you also talked about this idea of vulnerability and knowing when to ask for help, having the courage to ask for help. And yes, as a human, it's hard for most people to ask for help, but especially people who have lived their lives, hmm. like my audience, being the one who always had the answer, being the one that people came to for help. And now you're in this situation where, wow, asking for help is probably the best choice. Do you have any techniques or like exercises that you use with high performers? Let's do some baby steps here. Let's like ask sure. for help taking out the trash or something. I <laughs> well, I think that's, that's a, a wonderful, simple thing uh, that you just said there. Like, because what it alludes to is a matter of creating a, a new routine, a new habit, something that you can commit to doing at least consistently and frequently enough to start to make some subtle shifts. And I'm not talking about full 180 change here. I mean, come on. That, that, I mean, we know if we're going 120 miles an hour and we're trying to make a 180 in, on, a, on a dime, it ain't happening. You know, we're going to end up in a ditch or worse than a severe roll. But we're talking about a subtle change, you know, a subtle change over time. But it's choosing a few little things that could start to make an immediate impact. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we're all energetic beings and energy, we're, we're chasing it all the time, you know, and we forget that our body has a great ability to produce energy for us, but we got to feed it with something. You know, we got to put that fuel in and we have to start to ask ourselves, what are the fuel sources that we're using to power ourselves through on these days? Because it's something that we do every day, multiple times a day, at least usually we should. <laughs> I'm not saying like, I, I can appreciate it. I've had some friends going through their various programs in, in time. And, uh, and I remember them telling me, I, I, I just have to go to the cafeteria and I have to go to the vending machine. And that's all I got time for. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Well, I, I can appreciate that. But there's always a way. There's an alternative way all the time. But some of it might require big changes. You know, it might require you waking up a bit earlier to prepare a couple of little meals or some healthier snacks to take with you on your day. Carry a little cooler with you. I, oh, I don't want to carry a cooler. Oh, I commute on my bike. I mean, uh, I don't know if that's convenient. I'm like, so is eating unhealthy convenient? You know, is feeling the way that you are? Convenient, right, is you know, being like, in the hospital for two weeks convenient? <laughs> How convenient is that, right? <laughs> well said, exactly. And, and and I, but I look at food as one of those things that it, it, we do it all the time, and we know we need nourishment. But I find that by changing just how we eat and what we're eating, within a week, things change very quickly. You know, you change that fuel source, right? It, it's it's like trying to put a. a gasoline in a diesel engine, right? Or, or trying to put gas in an electric car. I mean, it's just like, what are you doing? You know, it's not going to run very well. You know, <laughs> like, that's not the kind of juice it wants, you know, and, and starting to look at those inputs because like science will tell us, you know, you got to monitor the inputs to gauge what the outputs are. Now we can create a hypothesis, but fortunately for us, we've got a millennia of people eating food and we've been documenting all these different types of foods for the last, you know, 50 years. We got a really good understanding of nutritionary science and how our body reacts with certain foods, combinations of foods. My invitation to people, and this is where I get most high performers started, 
I want you to start every morning with a green smoothie. And they're like, huh? a green smoothie. I got some of these guys, right? They're like, oh man, I don't eat greens. I'm like, well, there's your first problem. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to push back on that one right now, you know? And, and I invite them like every morning, non-negotiable, you know, you treat this like your doctoral, you treat this like your dissertation. I mean, yeah. you're not going to skip out on that, are you? No, of course not. Well, I don't want you to skip out on this either because this is for you and nobody else. This is for you. But if they do that after a week, they always tell me, oh my goodness, I, 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 you know, I don't even feel like going out for that fast food lunch anymore. I don't feel like buying food from the vending machine because you start to feel good. You start to feel like, wow, I got this like sort of renewed energy and you make better decisions throughout the day as a result of that simple way that you began the day. Yes, it comes so quickly. And I, I love that you're talking about small changes, subtle changes, because yes, if you're going 120 mi miles an hour, you don't want to make a quick right turn, right? You need to slow it down. You need to turn on the blinker, you know, all those things. And a green smoothie, it's one little thing, right? Audience, if you're listening to this going, wow, I know I'm on a fast track to a place that's not going to serve me, my family, my community. What's one thing you can do that will change how you are, you are experiencing life? A green smoothie. As you were talking, which I love, by the way, myself, um, I had an aunt completely change her life by adding in an apple a day to start. Wow. Right? So an apple a day. And then you realize you're, you crave different things, right? You crave the healthier things and not the jack in the box. And then you do have more energy and then you're sleeping better and you're like, wow. Now I have the energy to prepare healthier meals and now I have the energy to get back to the gym. So don't think of it as you have to flip the switch and go from unhealthy to healthy. Just ask right now, I know something's popping in your head as we're talking, what's one thing you could do that would put you on this track to being able to live the best expression of yourself? Good question. Good question. You know, I'll write that down, everybody. <laughs> if you're driving, don't write that down. <laughs> but, uh, and if you can't so think well of something, maybe ask for help. <laughs> yes, right? yes. And, and, you know, we are very fortunate. We live in a day and age where there's lots of information out there. Now, I, I do appreciate that it can be confusing at times because sometimes we see one person saying one thing. We see another person saying another. And, and I always laugh because you could type into Google, I love Mother Teresa, you know, millions upon millions of hits. I hate Mother Teresa. Oh, millions and millions of blonde hits. Like what the heck's going on here? Right. And, and, and that's usually the way it is. Right. But treat yourself as your own experiment, you know, because we all are slightly different. We are. We might, right. We're all human beings, but the way we react to certain foods, the way that we react to certain, you know, stressful stimuli, like it, it's just different. We all handle things a little bit differently. So you have to really take it into full account this sort of self perspective and self-awareness piece, you know, and really monitor it. It was like a couple of days into having a smoothie, just ask yourself, like, what was your normal habit? You know, maybe you started the day with like a, a banana or a muffin or a donut. Like here in Canada, we got something called Double Double. Uh, there's this Tim Hortons franchise. It's national, right? It's like, and basically it's fast food coffee. And so the, the Double Double means two sugars, two creams, this big coffee, and they always have a pastry with it, right? Like that is the Canadian staple. And I see a lot of people start their days like that. But come 10 a.m., they're like, man, I'm famished. I need some more food because I'm crashing. Yeah. And our instant reaction is to go for something else to bring us that instant high again. So we start our days off on this ra crazy rail co uh, roller coaster, right? Uh, with our insulin levels and how we process our blood sugars and start with a green smoothie. It's so simple. It is like easy. And, I, and I'm someone that doesn't like to say easy. I prefer to use the word simple, but it really is easy. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't take a lot of planning. You just need some ingredients, prep them in its own little Ziploc bags. I always tell people, get all the ingredients out, make little Ziploc bags with all the main dry ingredients that you're going to require and just have that ready to go, you know, in the fridge, ready to go. Or I usually just put them in the freezer because it's, it's nice or frozen anyways. And then I just take out my Ziploc bag, throw it in. I add some water or some coconut milk, maybe coconut water sometimes. It's like after a workout, throw in a couple ice cubes. Blend it. I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to go. It's literally like one minute and I'm, I'm out the door sometimes with my smoothie in my hand. You know, it, it is simple to do people. So I am wondering what is in your Ziploc bag for those who uh, have never had a green smoothie before. I could guess, but I wanted to hear from you. So I'm, it's funny that you're asking. I've got this video I'm editing right now uh, because I recently had a lot of people ask me, like, what do you put in your smoothie every morning? 
because my smoothie over time ha has evolved. Okay. So it's, it is like a big meal for me. And it's usually what I do after my workout. So I work out in the mornings in a fasted state, have a couple glasses of water, I might have a espresso, and then I go for my workout or I go for a walk. It depends on how I'm feeling that moment that day. Sometimes it's just going for a walk in the sun. That's, and I'm like, that's good. But either way, I come back and I make my smoothie. That's my first meal of the day. I usually have a good base of spinach. So I take one, I uh, mean, two fistfuls, I just jam it in the Vitamix, you know, or, or it's already in my Ziploc bag. Cause I use some big freezer bags now, <laughs> just to put this in perspective, um, because spinach blends really well and it's a nice base. So I do that. I might have a couple tablespoons of dried, uh, like, um, uh, quick oats as well as, uh, a couple teaspoons of chia seeds already in there. Um, I also have a little bit of ginger and I use like minced ginger that comes in a jar. So I sort of just, uh, put that in. Uh, and then I usually use a protein, like some sort of protein supplement just to up the protein. Uh, and I, I use a product called BioEdge just because it's, it's all natural and it's plant-based. That, that just works better for me. Uh, again, I mentioned I have an immune condition and I find that dairy products aggravate that, creates a little bit of inflammation in my body. So I just, I avoid that. Now, I, I, I'm not saying go this way or that way. You just have to, again, figure that out for yourself. Try both and see which one you feel better with. Um, I also put... Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think what I have. I've got my frozen berries. I use a little bit of psyllium, uh, for, for fiber, uh, non-soluble fiber. And that's again, just everybody, you know, a little bit of extra fiber first thing in the morning. It's going to keep you everything running nice and smoothly. Okay. Quite literally. Uh, and, uh, and then on top of that, um, I add a, a scoop of greens. I know I've already got spinach in there, but I like to put in a scoop of, of greens product as well. It's just a powder, but it's like getting, you know, six to seven servings of, of fruits and vegetables. And, um, and I like it. it doesn't really have much of a flavor profile to it because the smoothie itself has that, but it, it is like a full meal. It, it's about 600 calories and it's, it's a pretty good size. You know, it's about 16 to 20 ounces. And I generally sip that over the next hour, usually when I'm responding to emails or maybe, um, just doing some social media. Like I, I just, I have that quiet time where I can just sort of zone out and do some administrative type stuff. And I just have my smoothie and that's it. Rock and roll, you know, and I'm going to tell you right now. I got a two a day habit. Okay. Cause sometimes I'll have one mid afternoon as well as my mid afternoon snack. So, um, sometimes I'll make extra in the morning and just put it aside in a little cup, put it in the fridge yeah. or in the freezer. Don't you just put it in the freezer cause it freezes too quickly, but I'll put it in the fridge and I'll have that later. That's a great strategy for not grabbing that two o'clock cup of coffee. That's going to cause you to crash and burn. Right. Correct. Correct. And, and, and full, you know, for those out there, like I, I've, and actually, Heather, I'll share this with you. I'll send you my uh, ebook of my uh, green recipes, my green okay. smoothie recipes. And you can just share that out with anybody that's interested. You can just include it on the, the notes page. So if anybody wants it, then just go and grab it, you know? And um, because I, I, I produced it a long time ago and I'm just like, here, I, I just give it away to everybody. I'm like, you know, here, take it, do it and let me know how it goes, you know? So, yeah. so just as a little gift, if people are like stressed and like, I'm not going to remember all this stuff. Don't worry. There's a dozen okay. recipes in there. They're all different. I always invite people try a different one every day for 12 days. And at the end of that, you'll know which one's your favorite. And chances are, you'll probably actually come up with your own recipe at that point because you'll have the confidence right. to do that. Okay. Right. You will. You'll have the confidence. Yeah. That's how it started with me too. I used to follow recipes. And then over time, you do, you get creative. It becomes fun. It's a new adventure. It's never boring. Mm -hmm. um, and I am going to recommend that people, even if it's just a sentence or two, journal. Before you start this and after, because I will see people and they'll say, I, I don't really, I don't think I noticed anything. I'm like, really? Because you haven't complained about your hips. Um, you haven't complained about not sleeping and you're a whole lot more pleasant to be around. So are you <laughs> sure you didn't notice anything? And sometimes the changes, you know, are subtle over a week. You get to the end, you're feeling great, but you don't remember that you were feeling so bad <laughs> before. Right. Oh, Heather, you're so right. Because also we get to place like i remember when i was morbidly obese you know at, at 14 you know, it was right before i made the changes i mean my normal was feeling crappy right you know like and and i was like five years removed from feeling good and you know it was so like and as a kid you know i can imagine that i started putting weight on at age nine well with those nine years of life i mean how much of that do i actually remember right and and so really all i had that formative you know awareness was feeling crappy about myself like that was my normal and a lot of people are like that, right? Like I, I'll talk to these people when I'm having these conversations. I'm like, so 
when was the last time you really felt healthy and vitality? You know, it was just yeah. oozing out of you. When was the last time you felt like that? You know, waking up in the morning, not feeling groggy or tired and ready to just attack your day. Oh, geez. I, I don't know if I've ever experienced that. I'm like, well, I bet you have. You just don't remember. But, uh, you know, be, feeling the way you are right now is not normal. It's not normal. You know, it, in fact, feeling great is the normal that you want to normalize. Right. And and that's within right. everybody's grasp. I really feel that. I really feel that. But but it takes effort. Right. It's not like it's going to happen overnight. But if you just commit to those little habits every day and you start to just 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 turn it into a ritual and make it happen. You will see changes and you're going to feel great for it. And, uh, and that's all that matters. You know, at the end of the day, I want people to feel great because they deserve it. And when you feel great, everyone around you benefits as well. Right. So think of it as a public service as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like that spin. I think that's great because it is true. It's true. Everybody impacts like my family. It's not going joke now. My wife has little, uh, like meal replacement bars, you know, like some of the, she, she will. So uh, just as an example, like in the glove box in the car in her purse my kids even sometimes in their backpacks or, or their fanny packs you know uh will yeah. we'll have an extra bar because they can tell when i'm starting to get hangry and my family will not talk to me when i'm hangry They're, they'll just pull out a bar and they're like dad eat this and we'll continue the conversation <laughs> <laughs> so right. it's it's but you'll find that when you start to eat healthier your body does utilize that energy very very effectively and you yeah. might find yourself you might actually start eating a little bit more frequently but Trust me, it's okay. It just means your body and metabolism becoming much, much more efficient. So don't deprive it of the energy it's asking for. And, and, and trust me, as you commit to this process, everything will shift very, very quickly. It's not like something you have to wait for. It's like, it's, in, it's instant. Okay. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Give it a try, guys. Let's everyone intend to reset our baseline to feeling great. And Di, uh, you've got a book out. I'm going to tease the audience here. I'm going to have you back and we're going to dig awesome. into your book yeah. in another episode. But before awesome. we wrap up this one, do you have any final words of wisdom or quote you'd like to share with the audience? Well, it, you know, it, it's okay. The, the, there's a quote that's always resonated with me and, and I've shared it many, many times. And it's, if you can't change the people around you, change the people around you. Association is everything. You know, Jim Rohn used to, to, to have a, a saying where he said we were the byproduct of the five closest relationships that we, we hold dear to ourselves, right? Those five people that we tend to surround ourselves with most frequently. We'll find that we start to act and feel and think and speak similarly to that audience. Well, if you're surrounding yourself with a bunch of people that also have a similar lifestyle, similar normalized, unhealthy, <laughs> you know, unhealth is normalized for them. Well, that might be really challenging to make some of these changes long-term. And so you can encourage, you can invite them to get on this journey with you, but you can't change them. They have to want to change themselves. And so if you get to a place and you can't change those people around you or influence them to make some shifts, you might need to find a new association. And that is okay. There's been a couple of times in my life I've had to do that. It was scary. It was intimidating because it's like, wow, you're my good friends. Or at least I thought you were. You know, But this is what I need for me. And as a prime example, when I stopped drinking, I, I, I had to go through this process because I realized the people that I used to hang out with were very uncomfortable with the new sober version of me. And to be fair, the conversations are pretty boring for me because two rounds in, I'm like, okay, no one wants to talk seriously right now. I, I'm not connecting. I got to go anyway. So, but, but that's what I like to leave people with, you know, is just, just think about your association. Think about who's influencing you right now and who's influencing you to choose the lifestyle habits that you have or maybe supporting or influencing those actions or inaction and, and be ready. You know, you deserve it. You deserve people around you that uplift you and inspire and motivate you. We could do an entire podcast on that, but I know there are people <laughs> listening right now that needed to hear, mm. give yourself permission to make that change. Mm. And I know some of the people are thinking, what if it's your family? I, I totally get that one too. Hey, listen, they're your family. You're able to choose them, but you can choose when you want to hang out with them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so be That's selective right. on that one, you know, it's, uh, but, but either way, I, I'm so excited for anybody out there right now, ready to make some shifts. And I can't wait to see some pictures of some green smoothies. Please share them with me. I'd love to see what you're making. I think it would be great. So find me on social, you know? It'd yes, I will have all your social links yeah. in the show notes so that people thank can you. connect with you that way. And I want to thank you so much for your time today, sharing your wisdom and your story with the audience. And I'm looking forward to having you back. 
Uh, thank you, Heather. It was an absolute pleasure. And uh, really, thank you for creating a space for these types of conversations, not only to be captured, but for all of us out there to be little flies on the wall and participate and listen in. I, I just think it's wonderful that you've created this. And uh, well, thank you. Thanks so much for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Until then, if you're looking for more ways to invite joy in your journey, check out the free resources at expandyourhappy.com. You'll find downloads like an article I wrote titled, The Doctoral Journey, 12 Things You Need to Know That They Probably Won't Tell You. You'll also find a PDF that organizes all podcasts by the seven steps detailed in the Happy Doc Student Handbook, which you can also find on the website. Finally, if you're looking for a Happy Doc Student swag, I've got that too. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel. And if you want to make my day, rate and review so that together we can change the way doctoral education is delivered and experienced. Hey, one more thing. Just a quick reminder that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only.